So getting a fresh understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what his purpose is in your life can change things. How many of you would say, I could use a change? Okay, good. So some of you are like, I hate change, but that's okay. Okay, this is a nice change. This is a change that you want to have happen, okay? Because this is something that will shift your walk with God into something that you're not striving for, but you can just walk in, okay? And, and when I began to understand the Holy Spirit and how he worked in my life, that's when my life really began to change. That's when things like I had been in church, I had tried to read my Bible, I would tried to do the things, and it was like just this cycle of trying. I'm trying to get it right. I'm trying to figure it out. But then I began to understand the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, I wasn't trying anymore. I was walking with him. I was living with him. I had a relationship with God that it wasn't about me doing things right. It was about inviting the Holy Spirit in and saying, okay, how do we do this together? Okay, doesn't that sound so much better than trying to be a Christian? I gotta, I'm trying to live for God. I'm trying. Man, that sounds like a lot of work. And that's not what God intended. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to get ahead of myself already, okay? The Holy Spirit is our helper, our comforter, our protector, our guide. It's the power of God living on the inside of us, okay? Now I'm getting ahead of myself again. So let's answer this question first, okay? When did the Holy Spirit show up on the scene? When did he show up, okay? I think a lot of us have different thoughts about that, what it might be. But in Genesis 1, Genesis 1, there's a verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters, So right at the beginning, we see this. The Spirit of God is there from the beginning, literally. Remember the last, in the beginning, the Spirit of God was there, was present. He was not a late addition, okay? He was there. He was active in the Old Testament. And this kind of is something that, honest, if I'm being honest, I knew But I never really thought about that much because I just think about the Holy Spirit being active in the New Testament and like the things that happen in the New Testament. But then I started to think anytime there was an act of power, anytime there was something revealed, anytime there was a prophet, you know, those, all those books in the middle, they're called the, the prophets. Anytime that happened, the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit is the active power of God on earth even in the Old Testament. And here's a few examples, okay? Every time God moved through men and women in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon them. That's the key. He rested on them for a moment, and then he left. Okay? Let's look at it. Oh, I almost tried to swipe the wrong one. Okay. You guys bear with me. This is my first time. I told the, the guys in the, in the beginning, I don't do two things with my hands very well, and so that's why I'm doing a lot of this. Because I'm thinking about swiping, and I'm like, what's going on? Okay, so first service, you get the best of me. Okay, so 2 Chronicles 15.1 says this. The Spirit of God came upon, right, there's that word, upon Azariah, son of Oded. And he began to speak the word of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit's there. He came upon this guy. In Judges 6.34, it says the Holy Spirit clothed. Gideon with power. What are, where do you put your clothes? Upon your body, right? They go upon you. Okay, Judges 14, 5 through 6. 5 through 6, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. How many of you would like to rip a lion's jaws apart? There's only men? <laughs> Literally, thank you, Abby. Abby is going to rip a lion's... <laughs> Jaws apart with the, her bare hands. Okay, and then finally, 1 Samuel 10.10. 10. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul, and he began to prophesy. So we see the Holy Spirit is present all throughout Scripture, right? But in the Old Testament, he's coming upon people, and then he's leaving. So it's a moment of power, and then it goes away, okay? 
So then we see in the Psalms, the book of Psalms, the Holy Spirit is all over the place, okay? King, Dr- King David addresses the work of the Holy Spirit in Psalm 51:11. He says, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The Spirit of God is referenced differently throughout Scripture. Okay, we see the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. We see all these different things. But now the fun thing, I think it's fun, is as you're reading your Bible, you can take notice of these mentions. Okay, so this, I like to write in my Bible. Um, Pastor Matt said a couple weeks ago, he said, if your Bible's not messed up, you are. We had a guy that used to say that. He had all these like quippy sayings. And he would say, if your Bible's not messed up, you are. And so I would like, I love writing my Bible. I love to highlight things. And so you can begin to mark where you see the Holy Spirit moving in, in God's word when you're reading it. Have one color or an underline or something. You can take notice of this so that you can begin to keep record of what you're learning about the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to give you an example. So this is what I would do, okay? So we're looking at the Holy Spirit, and in Psalm 98, verse 1, it says this, sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. And when you read this, you're like, well, the Holy Spirit's not there, but it is. Because what I noticed was it says his holy arm has shown his saving power, which made me think about salvation. So I began to look this up, and I was studying it with my favorite study tool called Google, and I Googled what does his holy arm represent, and it was Jesus. So we see his holy arm represents Jesus. So then what does his right hand represent? Mighty victory. It represents the power of the Lord which is the Holy Spirit. So now I understand everywhere in Scripture where it talks about the right hand of God, it's actually referencing the Holy Spirit. Whoa. Okay, you guys don't seem as excited as I am, but this is exciting, okay? So you can see now throughout the Old Testament that there's other verses that reference the right hand of God. And every time you see that, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. So now you can circle it in your Bible and you can begin to process, okay, Lord, well, what are you saying about the Holy Spirit? And why does it matter? Because this can give you confidence on how he works on earth. The cool thing is that we can understand the Bible is a continuous book. It's one thing that works together to get us to where we are today, okay? It all fits together. So that's why we don't pick and choose, and I'm going to believe this in the Bible, but I'm not going to believe this, and I like this verse, so I'm going to do that, but that one, it seems hard. It seems like a lot, so you know what? I'm just going to avoid that section of the Bible. Have you ever read through the Bible? You don't have to raise your hand, and you read through a scripture, and you're like, yeah, I don't like that. I'm just going to ignore that one. You can't do that. I mean, you can, but... Like, you're kind of missing the point. The Bible is actually the book. And from the beginning, the Spirit of God is a, is a cord woven through the entire thing. Jesus is a cord that's woven through the entire thing. It all connects together. So you might have questions about it, and absolutely, let's talk about that. I'm not saying like, oh, the Bible says this, why I believe it. Like, if there's something in you that's like, this is hard for me to understand, this is hard for me to digest, ask somebody, what does this verse mean? How does this, how does this relate to my life? I don't understand what's going on here. But that's what the power of the Holy Spirit does, is it enlightens God's word so that you can understand And we can bring those questions, and it all fits into the context of who God is, which is unchanging. The way the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament is the way that he works now. What he did then, he can and will do now. So, Abby, find a lion. Good luck. We'll see how that goes. No one and nowhere in Scripture says that the Holy Spirit stopped working. There's, it's, you won't find it in Scripture. In fact, in the Bible, it says the opposite. Okay, let's keep digging. You guys ready to get to Jesus? Everybody's like, oh, Old Testament, that's a lot. Okay, we're getting to Jesus, all right? This is, this is where the good stuff happens. So in Matthew 3, verse 16, it says this, And Jesus was baptized. Immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God which we know is the Holy Spirit. We're going to abbreviate. 
HS. Descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And that word rest there means that it came upon him. It found a place to be set and established. It didn't leave. So right away, something's different. Because in the Old Testament, it came upon and then it left. But in the New Testament here with Jesus, it rested upon him. And then in Luke 4, verse 1, it says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. This is right after we know this because Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, okay? So that's how we know this is, this is what happened next. And was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This is the first time in Scripture that we see this specific word, full of the Holy Spirit. And that word full means this, filled up of a hollow vessel, covered in every part of the soul, lacking nothing and complete. Lacking nothing and complete. So when Jesus came up from the water where he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, but it didn't just rest upon him, it filled him up completely. You guys with me? This is like a little bit more teaching, okay? I like it if you're like, I hate teaching in class. I'm sorry. Pastor Matt will be back soon. And then he, he's been pretty teachy lately though too. And so he just gets excited, more excited than me. So he, it, the Holy Spirit came and filled Jesus. And at this point, up until this point, Jesus had given up his divine right to be God. Interesting, no miracles were performed before the baptism. But when the baptism happened, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then his ministry began. Okay? Interesting, interesting. Being filled with the Holy Spirit helped Jesus, who is God, Jesus, fulfill his purpose. This was the first time that we begin to see him being active and empowered to do something greater, okay? Because before this, only in Scripture we saw him teaching in the temple, but there were no miracles performed until this moment, okay? The Holy Spirit came, and he did not leave. So Jesus then walked in the power of the Holy Spirit to perform miracles, to preach and teach, and also to choose death on the cross. And then... This is the coolest part. The power of the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. How does this affect us? The plan was all along to get the Holy Spirit to you and to me, okay? Jesus gave us the answer to this in John 14, 7. He says this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit. He's our advocate. We're going to talk about that word next week. Who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him. This is the line. Are you ready? Because he lives with you and now, he, now and later will be what? In you. It's this word. Right now he's with you. But later, something's going to happen. And when it, this is before Jesus is raised from the dead, right? Later, he's, something's going to happen, he's saying, and, and he's not just going to be with you, but he's going to be in you, the Holy Spirit. Jesus was letting the disciples know that soon they would be full of the Holy Spirit to help them, to comfort them, to lead them into all truth. Now, this changes things. So we saw who the Holy Spirit was. And then we saw, okay, with Jesus, what happened? Something significant happened when the Holy Spirit and Jesus came together. Now what happens after? Okay, so now we're in the after part, how we're walking it out. What is next? Jesus said something's happening, and it's going to change things, okay? No longer does the Holy Spirit choose a few people to come upon and then leave, but now everyone's going to have the opportunity to be full of the Holy Spirit and never have it leave. This changes things. And we see this happen in the book of Acts. After Jesus ascends to heaven, the Holy Spirit filled the upper room. 
He filled those, so that word is full, lacking nothing and complete. The work was done on the cross, and Jesus was able to leave the people with the gift of this Holy Spirit. And this is where the church was born. The church was born in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything, and I love Derek read this verse during the transition, which we didn't even talk about it. But it's, he says, everything I do and more, you're going to have access to. And I don't know about you, but that verse has, I'm like, I'm not ripping arms from lions. Like, I'm not raising the dead. Like, I'm not changing water into wine. I'm not doing any of those things. So how could Jesus say, even greater things will you do? Think about it. Jesus had the Holy Spirit for three years. One person, three years. So he could do some stuff, and he did, right? That's the Bible. That's the New Testament. But what he was saying is, all of you, every day, are going to have the power to walk out the Holy Spirit. Greater in number, greater in power, because when we come together, all of us together, every single day, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do more, to do greater. It's even more. That's what he was talking about. It's not just one man for three years. It's everybody has access to the power of the Holy Spirit to do even more than you could ask, think, or imagine. That's what he was talking about. All of his power flowing through you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives on the inside of you. If you've accepted Jesus, if you've said, Holy Spirit, fill my life, the same power that, guys, it's powerful. It raised Jesus from the dead. If you don't believe me, let's go back to the Bible. That's not it. Romans 8, 11, it says this, the what? Spirit of God, who we know is old HS, okay, who raised Jesus from the dead. Oh, wait a minute. Let's read that again. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living in you. This is how my Bible looks. What? (laughs) Holy cow. (laughs) You mean all the dead things that are in my life? You mean all the anxiety, all the fear, all the depression, all the heartache, all the brokenness that's alive on the inside of me? I can exchange those for the power of God that has been released into the earth to live on the inside of me? What? Wow. That's amazing. That's the life we get to live. So the Old Testament, Jesus was hover, or the Holy Spirit was hovering, right? And then he comes down and he rests on Jesus and he fills him. And then Jesus is raised from the dead and the Holy Spirit is released. I feel like the Holy Spirit was just like, I'm done hovering. Okay. All right, I came upon him. Okay, when's the time? When's it time? And Jesus is like, just chill. I'm not done. I've got stuff to do. This is ad lib, okay? This is not scripture. And the Holy Spirit's like, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. And God's like, get ready, get ready. All of my people who I love are about to experience the goodness of God every moment of every day in every situation. This means that the Holy Spirit wants to come into your life and empower you to live a different life. I just really felt like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait. I'm not going to tell you that yet. I got a, a couple quick things. <laughs> that how does this affect you day to day? Because I don't ever want to give you something that you're like, great, I understand that now, but what does that mean for my life? How, how do I take that when I leave this place and what do I do with that? Because I, I grew up in a church where the teaching was amazing, but I would get in the car and be like, I don't know how to apply that. Like, what, what does that mean for me? And so what I want to do is I want to give you three things that change in your life when we receive the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to talk about that, what that means. Okay, number one, you know that you are not alone. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you invite the Holy Spirit in through Jesus, you recognize, I'm not alone. Our lives were never meant to be lived alone. 
And often we, we talk about that here at Mercy City in the context of relationship. We're like, get in a group, get on a team, make a friend. Absolutely do those things. But if we don't first have a relationship with Jesus, none of that matters. None of it matters. You'll never feel fulfilled in your earthly relationships. You'll always come up empty until you invite Jesus in. Some of us have been disappointed with relationships and we've given up on trying to have relationships, friendships, or maybe even romantic relationships, whatever that is, we've been hurt, we've been burned, we've been, you know, it's just like, I thought this wouldn't be what made me happy and I just still feel empty. It's because you're missing out on a relationship with Jesus. God created you specifically for relationship with him. That's the whole reason we were put on this earth. Our relationship with Jesus is in direct relationship to how much we access the Holy Spirit. When we respond to Jesus through salvation, when we were kids, we would, we would pray. If you grew up in the church, oh, I'm gonna ask Jesus to live in my heart. But the Bible actually says that Jesus is our mediator and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But what he did give us was the Holy Spirit. So when we receive Jesus, what happens is the Holy Spirit begins to do a work on the inside of us. And for some of us, that gift has been laying dormant. We haven't activated it, so we're still trying to be a Christian. The Holy Spirit's there, but we, we've just ignored him. We haven't accessed him. We haven't acknowledged him. We're still waiting for Jesus to make a house on the inside of us. But he's saying, hey, I'm actually in heaven mediating on your behalf, acting as your covering for sin, offering forgiveness and grace and mercy. But what lives on the inside of you is my power, is my power to, number two, help you live a Christian life. How, what, when we think about living a Christian life, what, what do we think about? We think about reading the Bible. How many of you have ever read the Bible and thought, I don't know what that meant? I don't understand any of that. That is weird. But what if you asked, Holy Spirit, help me understand your truth. Back in John, when I read that, it said that he leads us into all truth. Well, what's the truth? It's the word. So he shows us what he's talking about. You know how I do that in the morning when I'm getting ready to be my, read my Bible? I say, Lord, help me see something new. Holy Spirit, show me something. And let it change me so that I can overcome sin in my life. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, have, have been circling around the same sin, struggling to overcome it, struggling to move past it? It's because we haven't allowed the power of God to bring conviction. We've ignored the Holy Spirit because it's weird and I don't understand it. Well, now you're accountable for what you know. <laughs> now you have the access to say, God, convict me of that sin. Help me not to sin. Grace, sometimes we think of, when we think of God's grace, it's like a covering, right? Well, I messed up, but God's grace will cover it. Grace is actually the empowerment not to sin through the Holy Spirit. It's saying, I don't have to sin because I've got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me. And I don't know if you knew, but the Holy Spirit brings dead things back to life. I don't know if you knew, but the Holy Spirit brings power to overcome sin, brings power to get out of the cycle that we've been living in. It helps us become more like Christ. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to fulfill his purpose on earth, how much more do we? Trying to live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit, it's going to be tough. You're going to have to try really hard. And that's not what God had planned. He didn't want you to try at all. He wants you to rest in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit do the heavy lifting. And the final thing that the Holy Spirit does that we have access to is he brings comfort and peace. The kind that doesn't make sense. It passes all understanding, Philippians says. And when we invite the Holy Spirit in, the course of our life will change. It affects everything. It affects everything. Maybe it's been dormant in you. 
and you've thought, I think I'm saved, but nothing's changing. I wonder if this week you just started to pray, Holy Spirit, do a work in me today. I want to invite you in. It's, it's that simple. It's saying, God's, God is a gentleman, and he will never force you to do anything, so he waits for an invitation. He waits for us to say, hey, would you convict my heart? Would you show me if there's anything in me? Would you lead me? Would you help me? Would you guide me? Because that salvation comes in, but then he empowers us to live a Christian life by bringing us peace and comfort. It's the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord. Here it is. Here it is, guys. Have peace. Have comfort. Have forgiveness. It's the hand of God as a gift to you to change everything. Today, I think, I think some of us have been living this Christian life alone. We're like, I, I tr I'm trying. I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to make it work, and it is hard. That's not what the intention was. It should not be hard to be a Christian because we have the power of God. We have access to the power of God. Today, some of us need to understand, we take a next step with Jesus and we say, Jesus, live in my heart. I confess the Bible is so simple. Salvation isn't hard. Knowing Jesus isn't hard. The Bible says in Romans that we just confess with our mouth that we believe that he died for us, that he's our savior, and, and we say it out loud. We believe it in our heart and we confess it with our mouth. We're saved, boom. When I got saved, I, there was no prayer team. There was no altar ministry. There was no pastor. There was no stage. I was alone in my dorm room. And I said, Jesus, I know that you're my savior. Oh, I'm saved. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again. I believe that you're here with me, that I'm not alone. And I was saved. I was no longer headed for hell and destruction, but I was headed for heaven and new life. And I began to have access then. So I had people that taught me about the Holy Spirit, people that taught me about how to walk it out. And it changed everything. But that first step is so important. It's acknowledging I need Jesus. I believe who he is. I'm gonna say it out loud. I'm gonna tell somebody. And maybe today you're like, I don't know if I've, I've done that. I'm not, I'm not gonna lead you in a prayer. What I wanna encourage you to do is to tell somebody, I believe that Jesus is my savior. You are saved. You are saved. Now what we get to do is then say, Holy Spirit, start the work. Let's get active. Let's do something significant. Let's do it together.